Why y'all niggas in the in, in the bank? Do you feel like they're gonna do the same thing with um marijuana? I think that marijuana is gonna become the new beer of America. I think Budweiser and all of them are smart enough to line up. Coors Light, you notice all these Budweiser people. One other thing that I think is interesting about marijuana industry is that if you look at the people who are getting into it and have bought the licenses early, the majority of them are law enforcement or they're connected to law enforcement somewhere. Like in California, some of the biggest places that they have, the people that run it are ex-law enforcement. Mm. And I've seen the way that they react when they get shaken down because whether it's black or Latino gang show up, yo, you operating in our neighborhood, homie. What about the tax? The blood tax, the crypt tax, the SA tax? You gotta yeah. pay something. Right. Okay, sure. Would you like to meet the company president tomorrow? He's an ex-gang intelligence officer. I'm sure he'd love to know your name and know what you're doing. Smart. All right, man, take care. Right, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Do your fucking thing. You got to um, be protected by somebody down there. Listen, they will shake you down. And I think that, that that business already is interesting because you'll see the way that it operates. For example, you can't move trees in bulk from California to Oregon or Oregon to Washington. Each state is relegated into itself, so it's a closed market. Right. So that's why some places get super surplus. And that's why maybe like, I want to say a few years ago, the, the weed in, in Oregon, like Portland, dirt fucking cheap. Whereas you went to California, double, triple the price, only because of the surplus. So now I'm wondering if it is legalized, how are they going to do that across state lines? Right. And who's going to have those licenses? <clears throat> and the the most tax is like 12%, right? right? It's too crazy. And the other part is how can the government pay its bills with drug money? when it's spent the last 40 years locking people up for paying their bills with drug money. Uh, we, I think that's the flip side, right? We talked about this, uh, uh, and one of the people I, I've been working with, a professor named Jim Vretos from uh, John Jay College, who uh, was talking about uh, restorative justice. That was the term that him and a lot of people had began to use. And restorative justice simply means that if the state's going to make billions of dollars a year, then those... Uh, Locked those cases, those cases need to get wiped. People need their voting rights back. People need to have the strikes that are put against them in family court and the inability to see their kids because of this stuff. Right. Those have to be corrected. Um, criminal cases where people no longer have, uh, 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 can't get a job or they have felonies, those need to be stricken from the record. That's what I mean. If they're going to wipe their slate clean, they should do that. For then everybody case. else needs it. If they're going to bail themselves out morally. Right? Because it used to be a moral failing. That's, oh my God. And in the Latino community, it's 10 times worse. Because these people get shit faced all fucking day, still go to work. But through Fumatu un poquito, el diablo, oh my God. He's like the devil. He's gonna take you to church and put fucking pray over you. Shut up. If you were high, then you wouldn't have been doing half the shit you was doing. Right? Right? And when they, the, the shit that the, some of my relatives say to me trips me out. They're like, what if you got in a car? And drove while you were hot. Right. And I'm like, what if somebody drank liquor? Right. And, got into a car and drove like you do, motherfucker. Right. Fuck out. Of you know what's gonna happen if I get high, get in the car? I'm gonna drive 25 miles an hour an hour. to Waffle House. You know what happens when you get drunk? You hurt people. Shut the fuck up. Well, it's a big difference. Come on, bro. It's a big difference. So I think that that definitely things that are gonna have to be addressed. I think also the. The thing that a lot of people are very critical are the optics of it, right? Little white girl starts a business. Oh, man. Great. Entrepreneur. Brothers start a business. Oh, a bunch of weed dealers. You know, mm. Jay-Z, the crack dealer for the rest of his life, right? Which means that JFK's father, bootlegger mm. for the rest of your life. What the fuck? Like, right. come on. You can't clean your... You can't clear up your shit. You want to play that game with me? Okay. Thomas Jefferson. Oh. Old school Jeffrey Epstein of his fucking time. Country was founded by Jeffrey Epstein. Don't fucking play with me, dude. George Washington. You know, he didn't have wooden teeth. The teeth he had were the, the, the slave's teeth that he knocked out of their fucking mouth that he wanted to put in his mouth. Don't play with me. Don't tell me about the negativity and the criminal history of our people. I will hold up a mirror and show you the criminal history of this country, which is horrific compared to anything that we've had. And whenever people say, oh, get over it, you know, I've just seen that interesting meme running around with the, with the, the, the whites only uh, fountain, and then they uh, show you the same dude, and he's not that much older. He like my, he, he less than my, he's younger than my father. Wow. 
And you could, and he was born in that era. And I remind people that the reason why I, I think I've had a lot of success with, uh, shout out to my brother Riza Islam on the West Coast, talking to people is because individuals have approached me and said, well, what have indigenous people gotten against fighting black people? Nothing, right? What did being a Buffalo soldier get you? They told you was gonna get the right to vote in the early 1800s. They didn't get to you till 1967. Right. America didn't become a democracy until 1960, and it's still not. Right. So I, I'm like, yo, y'all not gonna play that game with me. Well, so no, whenever no people place run, is actually So fun. whenever people run that gambit yeah. about what our people have done wrong and the stigmatism against mm -hmm. them, selling drugs, selling, we're, we're the middleman, right? I always tell people, El Chapo, he was in the news, El Chapo, I'm gonna get in trouble for this, but fine. He's a middleman. He's not the boss. He represents the middleman between the cartels of Mexico and the American cartel. When I say the American cartel, I don't mean a guy with a sombrero and a fucking mustache. No, right. an American cartel is run by a white guy, right. a guy who has friends on both, I don't know his name, but a guy who has friends on both sides of the aisle, who has access to legal drug and pharmaceutical companies and illegal stuff. You know, it, it's not a mystery that we invaded Afghanistan and heroin production goes up 95% to the highest it's ever been. That's not a that's not, for, that's for not those who action. don't know. Afghanistan is like they make a lot of heroin, heroin right. out there. Right, and, I, and, and you know, my country, Peru. Here's another funny one. Uh, you've heard the phrase "Colombian drug lord" many times in the American lexicon, but you never heard "Peruvian drug lord." Why? We moved twenty. Well, not we. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> Peru yeah. Yeah. moves twenty. About I would say between depending on the year, about twenty-five to almost thirty-five percent more heroin. Than mm -hmm. all the other states of South America combined. Mm -hmm. Cocaine or heroin? Cocaine. Excuse me, cocaine. The reason that it's not as discussed is because we have a direct, or Peru has a direct deal with the cartel of the United States. And the Colombians have always had to go through Mexico, which is what gives them all that extra shit that goes along with it. Right. Meanwhile, huh, drop off in the Virgin Islands, mm -hmm. drop off at a military base, mm -hmm. drop off here, right? When, you're, when your militaries are like this, it's gonna happen, and at the end of the day, you, you just need some method of control, and people realized a long time ago, we're gonna have to control these 400 million people who live in this country. Hate mm -hmm. the government or like it, mm -hmm. it's an achievement to control 400 million people yeah. and have them in the same place and not destroy one another, right? right? Anyone ever throw a party at their house? <laughs> you, right. you did some cleaning, you know what I mean? Yeah. Some clean a government got a party with 400 million people going on, right? right? Uh, I, as much as you hate them or think what they're doing is wrong, I always tell people, before, before we imagine revolution, just be prepared for anarchy and what that costs. Because that's yeah. insane. No government, no nothing, the, the full total breakdown. And that's why I remind people, that's why people revere Malcolm X so much, because he was a person who took all those things into account. He was a person that just wasn't doing blind, reckless shit. He was like, yo, there are going to be consequences. When the revolution finally does start, there will be people who get killed on the front line. Mm -hmm. There are people who will have to die. There are people who will have to sacrifice, will have to find a contingency plan to protect the women and children. That's how this works. Right? It's like, oh my God. And now you're talking about the nuts and bolts of revolution. right? Che Guevara, a controversial figure. What was the difference between him and other people? He actually said, if someone gets a... Uh, 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 condemned to execution, right? They have to face the death penalty, and I gave them that sentence, I'll be right. in the firing squad. Right. Some people found that barbaric. Is it any less barbaric than Arnold Schwarzenegger, who killed Tukey Williams by signing a piece of paper, but yeah. didn't have the courage to pull the lever himself? Yeah. What is the difference, right? And I guess that, that's where you get into the, the nuts and bolts of man. a human being, right? Yeah. But I mean, are you less of a murderer because you ordered it rather than pulled the trigger? Not at all. Ah. However, there, there's a detachment. It's just like the, the right. people who launch missiles from drones a corporate are murder. not the same as the people who shoot bullets from guns. Right. They don't have. They don't feel the same guilt. They don't feel mm -hmm. the same uh, uh, like a video attachment game. to to what happens. Yeah. It's like I hit this mm -hmm. button, something blew up. You can see it, but you like you know. face it. Yeah. Which is interesting about warfare. Like in the past, in order to go to war, you couldn't go unless a member of your family led it. Like if you were the king. You couldn't just send a dolce. It had to be like your son or you. Right. And I think what was interesting about like the, the 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 development of warfare is that we've been getting farther and farther apart from each other. We started out real close, and we saw what war cost us in mm -hmm. arms, legs, limbs, 
cracked open heads. Right. And we didn't learn from that. I think that started with dem democracy. That's where the separation started to come. Hmm. Where I'm, I'm, we're, we're just the ones making the decisions. <clears throat> Protect our families. We have to make right. these decisions, but send everybody else out. But I think, mm -hmm. look, it's it, democracy, or it could be the, the republic in general, because at the end of the day, mm -hmm. it looks like a functional system, but um, whatever government exists, at the end of the day, you have to recognize that it's simply just people who rule over other people. Mm -hmm. right. And they created a bureaucracy or a system in between to give the, the, the image that somehow this is all going to run in other people's favor. Okay. Right? But it, it, it doesn't. It usually, there's, there's, an old, uh, there's an old book, I think Robert Michaels wrote it. Um, it's called The Iron Law of Oligarchy. It says that whether a government is communist or capitalist, socialist, social democrat, whatever you choose to be, he said eventually they all fall victim to the iron law of oligarchy. Oligarchy means the rule of the few. Yeah. He said if it's a Senate, it becomes a few people in the Senate who control everything. A big Politburo, a communist, but ah, now we have a tiny group of people and in an in inner council. A presidency, huh? Sure, now we have a president and now he has more powers than he ever had before. A king, a king can't rule alone. Right? That's an interesting thing. He needs a hand. He needs a hand and the most important hand that he gets it's from God. What happens when dictatorship's not enough? That's when monarchy comes into, into play. Where you have to say, no, it's not just that I'm king, it's that God made me king. And that's or I'm thing. God. Right, and then people get involved hmm. in, in the control of, of, of fear and repression not being enough. It's not enough for a human being, I think. Mm -hmm. I think the ultimate control is that idea of faith and then what a person actually believes because I think a human being I've met from all around the world, I've been everywhere, the Middle East, Asia, Africa, Latin America, and all human beings, if I can study their history, are the same. You can keep them enslaved, you can keep them on the ground, but the moment you take your foot off them, they'll stand up and they'll fight against you. Right. Right? It doesn't matter if it's Britain occupying Ireland, if it's Japan occupying Korea, China, it doesn't matter if it's France, or Haiti. France and Haiti, right. eventually, you have to stay down there with the people because the moment you let go of them, human beings are just wired to stand up no. and yep. say, get the fuck away from me, get off me. It's like we were bred to be warriors and mm -hmm. it doesn't matter, even the most calm human being, they see someone being abused in their family, they want to protect them, they have the natural inkling to fight so you can't just conquer us with that, you have to make us believe in you as an oppressor. Yep. We can't just fear you. Right. We have to believe that we wouldn't be anywhere without you. Mm -hmm. We have to believe that somehow you brought us someone who saved our souls because we were living in ignorance without you. And even if we choose the, the communist perspective, then we start to believe that our revolution began with a white man in Europe who wrote a manifesto. When you came to the dark jungles of Africa and Latin America to teach us the complex concept of sharing, <laughs> we knew what that was for thousands of years. All right. <laughs> This is crazy. Oh, man. It's almost time. Yeah, okay. This conversation can go on and on <laughs> and on and on. Long, and on. Um, you mentioned Diablo um, a little, uh, about five minutes back. Mm -hmm. How real was Dance with the Devil? I could take you to the building in Harlem where it happened. However, I always tell people that I changed aspects of the story, obviously. Like yeah. I wasn't on the roof, you know, I never raped a woman, like get the fuck out of here. But right. at the same time, I felt like because it happened in, in, in where I was and because it was a story that I'd heard constantly, I was like, yo, this is like a ghetto fairy tale. Yeah. I gotta tell this shit. But then I realized it's not a ghetto fairy tale. This is a part of like, like you, you, okay, this is a part of human history, right? There's never been a song about rape, but at the same time, if we're all alive, here's an interesting thing, we're all related. Every single person who's alive is related because we all have an uncle who never had any kids and a great aunt who never had any kids, so their bloodline died. Right. The fact that we're all alive means we come from some branch that's maybe two, 3,000 years ago. Right. So every time a man rapes a woman, they're both two people who are alive and he's raping someone who in some way, shape, or form, maybe is two, related. three, or maybe 17, or maybe 175, which is a large number, but represents thousands of years, 175 generations. 
he's raping a part of himself. And also, one interesting fucked up thing uh, is that we don't realize how many people are the product of violation. In other words, marital rape was only a crime in the late 80s, only became a crime. So as long as you were married to a woman, you, you could do, do anything. You could do anything. Choose your property. And I think that's seen through like Roman law tradition. Mm -hmm. Like if you see in ancient Rome, the man had the power of life and death over his wife and children. In other words, if they felt like they disrespected him, they stole from him, yeah. he could legally kill his wife and there were no consequences, which that's, is fucked up because a lot of people say that's where the, the whole Catholic uh, ceremony of the father giving the daughter to the husband, like, right. I no longer have ownership should, of her, yeah, now so. you have ownership, right. but again. But the man was always like the, the, the hierarchy of the family. Um, mm -hmm. Even in the Bible, if a woman made a vow, mm -hmm. the husband could disallow it right. and say, nah, she was bullshitting. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> don't, don't pay that no mind. Um, and adultery had to involve a married woman. Well, your husband went out there and he did whatever that was not considered adultery and had to involve a married woman because there was ownership to it. And that's where the violation came in. Mm. But um, Dance with the Devil being, did you expect like, I'm going to write this record about this horrible talk about situation. It 20 years, 30 years. And this is going to be like the breakthrough record of my career. Like. All right, if I could be totally honest, the part that surprised me um, is when I got a call, I think it was 2007, 2008, mm -hmm. and someone was like, yo, I want to send you some crazy shit. And I was like, what? And they were like, yo, just watch this, this newscast. And they sent me a newscast from England. I forget what city. It was like Manchester, Liverpool. Yeah. And they were called the Dance with the Devil Murders. And someone had stabbed someone. I think it was England. I'm not sure. But it was somewhere in Europe. And someone had basically violated a girl that they were somehow related. I don't know if it was a cousin yeah. or a stepsister, somebody that was related to, and then had stabbed them to death. And then afterwards, the person found out that it was, they were related to them, and the person took their own life. They were just like, yo, this is... And they titled it after your record. And then they, someone called me about it, called me from the station. They were like, well, how do you feel about this? And I say, I, I didn't invent this scenario. I said, this has been going on for years, right? Before me, before hip-hop, hip-hop didn't invent rape, right? I said, unfortunately, we're talking about something that, that, that we're not going to get rid of until humanity evolves. Right. We'll still be a primitive species. As long as we're still raping people, we're still a primitive species. We're still a talking monkey. A human being, an enlightened creature, doesn't do things like that. Right. And I think that that will be that and other things that I see. Killing children at war and thinking that's just a collateral it's, damage. Yeah, that, that, until we evolve past those things. You know, those simple things. It seems like really simple, simple things. things. Don't yeah. touch nobody that don't want to be touched. Don't force yourself. They seem like, like really, really simple, simple things. fucking things, but you don't get it. Because you're still part animal and not part divine being. You're right. feeding into the worst part of what you are. Right. Rather than accepting what all that you could possibly be. Right. So I think that, that speaks a lot to it. And I think that, that song captured that emotion perfectly. And also the fact that it was a story about it so graphically with a horrible ending. Because that's the only way that those fucking things end. Yeah, it was like real there's no, there's no night fucking, Shyamalan. There's no, there's no happy <laughs> it's real, fucking ending. Real, no, real but like no the end is like, damn, that's it? That, that's what it is? No, damn, but that, that's, that, that, like damn. I said, that's what I'm saying. In life sometimes, there ain't no happy endings, yeah. right? The, 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 the bad guy doesn't always get his. Sometimes the bad guy ends up president, senator, you know, head of the company. You know, sometimes the good guy, he gets stabbed in the back and framed. And that comes you know? full circle to what or we, he, what we started died, this video about. he dies about. in a helicopter crash and people ri ridicule his legacy and rip him apart for things that we, you know what I mean? Yeah. You had every opportunity to do so. So it could be anything, mm -hmm. you know? You don't, that, that's what I always say and I, I, always, I always tell people that's the part that warmed my heart. If I could be heartfelt, that warmed my heart about Pumpkinhead. Because a lot of my friends were mad when he passed away. Rest in peace, like, PH. Rest in peace, PH. They were mad that, they, that only people were giving him his due then. 
And I, I said some shit to all them from my heart. I said, yo, not for nothing. I read when Robin Williams died, who came to my school as a little kid and did a show for a bunch of people, a bunch of sick kids, and then the rest of us, and was just cool, and he made us all laugh. And when he died, they wrote, Clown Hangs Himself on a fucking tabloid. And I said, yo, they disrespected this man who was such a good dude, such a good person. And I said to myself, man, they might be giving him his laurels after he dies, but at least they're acknowledging him. At least I didn't read one bad article shitting on him or trying to take one part of yeah. his life where he made a mistake or yeah. did some dumb shit and put a spotlight just, just on, on that. that. So I'm grateful that people saw my brother PH in his full capacity. Like, this is all he did. You know what I mean? This is everything that came together. This is what happened. Boom, boom, boom. These are his contributions. And he definitely was a person that influenced me and helped me, you know? When I saw him battle Breeze at the base battle, I was like, yo, it's these crazy. two dudes are monsters. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then I always remember, I, I make niggas laugh whenever I say this, because first time I ever meet PH, it was before I got locked up. So I must have been like 19, 20. And I told my man, I was like, yo, this nigga's 23, man. He's mad old. Was it? And everybody was laughing. They're like, yeah, that nigga's mad old. But he cool. He yeah. cool for older niggas. <laughs> Everybody's like 17, 18. I'm like the oldest nigga there. Yeah. I'm like 18, 19. I'm like, yo, he's yeah. kind of old. And everybody was like, yeah, he's 23. He's mad old. Yeah. And now I think about 23. He's a fucking baby. Oh, man. PH. Um, if we, if we were to, well, not if, F. I'm actually doing a timeline on battle rap, and I might need you to sure. come in and speak on some stuff. I would definitely, any, anybody, especially PH and Breeze and all the people, and help pave the way for people like me. And, you know, shout out to everybody who's still doing it out there. That's a fact. You know, it takes a lot of heart and it takes a lot of encouragement. And just remember, own your shit. Huh? Real talk. Own yeah. your shit, motherfucker. That, that's the, that's the inconvenience. That's for the niggas. message. <laughs> that's the message, man. Own your shit, man. Own your shit. Um, I want to thank you, thank you for coming on. I did want to mention uh, the police shooting. Ooh, I don't yeah. know if you got time. Got to get out of here. But it's all good. Um, we'll talk about that next episode. Harlem Cuts. Harlem Cuts, 2310 Second Avenue. You come in here, you mention the Mortal Technique or anybody else that's been on the show, you get a percentage off of your haircut. Right? <laughs> All right, cool. Um, we out of here, man. Let's get it. Yeah. I kick the fucking door off. Take the hinges with the door panel in the wall off. Bodies getting hauled off. Lips getting torn off. Leg him with the sword off. He looking like a walking dead zombie trying to crawl off.